Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast, your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta, and in Butte, Montana, or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. We definitely want to thank Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. And don't forget, Bee Culture makes a great Christmas present for the beekeeper in your life. While you're there, check out Bee Culture's Beekeeping Your First Three Years, a quarterly magazine for beginning beekeepers. We also want to we also appreciate the continued support of Global Patties. So Kim, it's about December and that time of year. Yeah, it's been weird this year, the December, and I guess every every year is weird in a different sort of way. We're gonna hit 50 this week. Wow. My family in Wisconsin has feet of snow in the driveway. Our friend Tom Theobald has feet of snow in his driveway in Colorado, and and it's just kind of weird all over. From a beekeeper's perspective, where I sit, 50 degrees isn't bad. It's a much less challenging winter than for the bees than 10 below, but spring can't get here fast enough. Yeah, I always wonder, is like 50 degrees harder on the bees because they go through the food faster or is it when it's below zero do they, when do they go through more food when it's they below do. zero or when it's 50 now when when it's warmer when we were doing wintering research in Wisconsin we we did four packs on a pallet and wrapped the whole pack and lots of insulation on top and hardly any openings on the bottom and they never made cluster in the winter in Wisconsin we insulated them so well and they ate a lot of food, but they were all there come spring. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess it's the trade-off of of if they cluster, if you have a tight cluster, they don't eat as much. But the stress has got to be higher than if they're if it's warm enough for them to be able to move around and and attend to business. So I go for the I go for the much too warm, eat lots of food. <laughs> as opposed to uh, way too cold and no, never break cluster. I'm, I, I put myself in the place of my bees. What would I rather be doing? And for me, that's what I'd rather be doing. Yeah, I was getting ready to ask if you were talking about yourself or your bees, that you keep them warm and eat <laughs> yeah. lots of food. <laughs> well, yeah, we uh, finally got below zero uh, last couple nights, and I've been watching uh, the thermometer on, on, on my colonies. Um, and just watch below the, zero, you got uh, to below zero or sorry, below freezing? Below zero, well, below zero centigrade. Uh, All right, below freezing. And there you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you look at them and you think, oh my gosh. And then, then I remember while well, the sensor, the temperature sensor is right in the center of the box, so that if they're off to the one side or the other, uh, you're not getting the full temperature of the cluster, but uh, you start seeing that temperature drop and the the temperature within the colony drop, you start, oh, I start second guessing myself and am I doing everything I can? It's the joys of beekeeping. That's it. Some, sometimes too much information is a bad thing. It's better just to see them out there in the field and say, yeah, they're doing fine, as opposed to watching the screen and saying, oh my gosh, it's so cold in that box. Speaking of this time of year, you have any uh, gift ideas for beekeepers? Well, I always do, uh, <laughs> and 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 uh, you know, just to be as selfish as I can, I often put myself at the top of that list. <laughs> what I look for as a beekeeper in terms of giving or receiving gifts, of course, is things that make better, make beekeeping better, easier, faster, cheaper, all of all of the above. And this year, I'm kind of slanting a little bit, and I mentioned the wrapping thing, and I'm lo- I'm actually looking ahead almost a year for next winter because mm-hmm. I'm. 
I'm going to be doing some things to do better with wintering for my bees, I think. Uh, but uh, I'm since I'm now um, unemployed, I've got uh, some things I want to look at here and, and uh, more books and more things to read and more things to learn. So uh, that's where I'm looking at. If you've got a, if you, you, you can never learn too much. Yeah. And, and every time a new book comes out, I'm anxious to look at it. What does, what's one thing every beekeeper needs? One thing every beekeeper needs, a new hive tool. <laughs> yeah, that's right. uh, <laughs> Other than that, you know, we've got a guest coming up here in a couple of weeks, the people from Northern Bee Books, and they've got an extensive list of reading. Of course, Bee Culture has a good library, too, and any of the bee supply companies have, and everybody's got a kind of different taste. You look at the, the people at Better Bee and the people at Data Ant and the people at Bee Culture, and, and they all have some books the same, but they all have some books that are different. So, um I guess cruise them all and find something that piques your interest and look at the newest stuff. Our our past guest Tom Seeley goes without oh, yeah. saying to to be one of the one of the people on your list. But Dewey Karen we've had and and uh, some of his books and Jim Two's books. So mm -hmm. there's a lot out there and there's new stuff coming every day. Well, you've listed quite a few authors, but don't forget you've written quite a few books yourself. So. What more could a beekeeper want? A book and a hive tool. What a great Christmas. <laughs> and the hive tool doubles as a bookmark. So, <laughs> Well, we have a good episode lined up for today. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we were able to chase down Kirsten Trainer at while she was at an entomology sh uh, a conference. And uh, she was able to hole up in a, in a conference room where she thought she was going to have some quiet space to talk to us. Every once in a while, you might hear some voices pass through. We tried to clean that up as much as we could. That's real. That's but, the real uh, world. Yeah, yes, it is. But let's get right to that interview with Kirsten. Okay. Hey, Kim, I'm really looking forward to this podcast. I've known of Kirsten for quite a few years, and this I'm looking forward to the opportunity to talk to her and her newest venture. Yeah, I am too. Um, I just got, I rushed home from a bee meeting so we could catch her. She's at an entomology meeting, I believe, and uh, getting three people together in three different time zones, sometimes, especially in the <laughs> evening, gets to be um, a puzzle and a half, but we arranged it. Uh, Kirsten, I want to welcome you to our show, Kirsten Trainer, and and I know that there's a lot of things going on in your world, but one of the things I want to talk about is your new magazine, Two Million Blossoms. Tell us, tell us, where did it come from and what are you going to do with it? That's an excellent question. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me on the show. Yeah. Uh, two, two Million Blossoms is going to be a new quarterly. It launches in January 2020. I'm currently running a Kickstarter campaign that's doing really well. It reached over 50% funding in the first week. And we're, we're, we keep coming climbing. So the goal is to make it as successful as possible. It's going to be a quarterly magazine that comes out um, in January and then every three months thereafter. Um, and it's going to be not just on beekeeping, but on all pollinators. And our first issue is absolutely jam-packed with some amazing authors, including yourself. Um, and uh, we have Marla Spivak talking, writing about self-medication in, in honeybee hives using propolis. Rusty Burlew from Honeybee Sweet will be talking about ethical beekeeping and some of the borderline questions that beekeepers have to deal with and where we all fall on, on that moral spectrum. Um, I'm really excited because I had reached out to award-winning author Craig Childs, who wrote The Secret Knowledge of Water. Um, it's a beautiful book, and in it, in the very few, first few pages, he describes chasing bees to a, a rare water source in the desert. And so I actually found him through Facebook reached out and asked if he would like to expand on that episode in that book. And he submitted a beautiful article in which he actually cites some of the research by Tom Seeley's lab. And so um, I've contacted Tom Seeley and he put me in touch with the first author on that, who actually also happens to be at Arizona State where I've landed. And she wrote a lovely companion piece on why honeybees do forage for water and how they make some of those decisions. So it, it's very exciting. It's going to be a beautiful coffee table-like magazine with lots of articles, very informative. 
One of the um, authors actually followed the migratory route of monarch butterflies, all 10,200 miles by bicycle. And she writes about her adventures um, traveling across from Mexico up to Texas into New York and then the back route, back following the monarchs all the way back down to their winter habitat. Well, I'll have to, I'll have to watch or read that article. I follow along on my bicycle with her. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, she had a great adventure and, and they ditched her right away. And then she was cycling as best she could. And, and she learned to, to think and feel a little bit like a monarch um, as she was cycling along the roads of of um, Texas, trying to find milkweed and, and and getting much better at spotting it. She even finds them in New York City. So it's wow. amazing the, the route they can manage. Well, that'll be a fun story. So, well, I yeah. think they all sound fun. I think you're going to have a, a, a hard time following up on the next issue. I, I would not... <laughs> I, I I can see I can see a challenge there, but uh, I I am humbled. I'm in good company, and this one the article I did for you was just a real down and dirty, uh, good, bad, and ugly pollinator garden. What people can and can't do. So I'm I'm uh, <laughs> yeah. You're in really I'm good company. I'm in good company. Uh, the guest editorial is written by Mark Winston on how there's a growing movement, um, not just to save the honeybees, but to save all bees. Um, and that's really what I'm trying to do with this magazine is there's sometimes a growing divide, especially in the news media, where honeybees are blamed for a lot of the illnesses of native <laughs> bees. And one of the big issues we're having is we just don't have enough habitat. A lot of people are very interested in protecting bees, but may not necessarily want to be beekeepers. And this magazine is really aimed at that sector. You touched on an on a interesting subject right there is... is uh habitat for pollinators, honeybees included, and, and there is growing discussion. I was putting it carefully. There's growing discussion <laughs> on putting bees in habitat uh, with other pollinators that isn't subject to poison. Correct. And from a beekeeper's perspective, it's ideal because there's no poison there, but then you enter in and, and introduce species, overpopulation, all of the things that come with that. That's there would be an interesting subject to follow up on, I think. Yeah, and, and we're going to address that. I mean, I think it's it's quite all right when you put a few hives into habitat like that. When you start dropping 100 colonies with 50,000 bees each, you are definitely having competition. And, and perhaps in our nature preserves, where we really are trying to protect biodiversity of our native plants, we might want to consider leaving that for native bees, whereas on the edges where we can put in a lot more crep type habitat um, on former ag land or ag land that's not worked, I think that's really the ideal part where we, we can learn to work together and not potentially drop a whole massive amount of honeybees into an area where we do have some endangered species that are, are struggling to, to keep going. I know Australia beekeepers have been going through this with their with their uh, government for government owned forests and trying to figure out how to reach that balance. So um, uh, we did a thing in our magazine recently about how much farmland we're losing three acres a minute. Yep. And and when you see that and you look at well how many acres are left. So yeah. Uh, it gets it gets it gets to be a challenge. I can see that. And and your two million blossoms are going to be down to a million and a half pretty quick if we're not careful. Well, it's two million blossoms for one pound of honey. And and the reason I chose the title is really to emphasize that we do just need more forage for everyone. Um, there have been some really interesting studies where actually along the power lines is, ends up being really good forage. If we can get a lot of those public spaces into pollinator habitat, it actually ends up costing the Department of Transportation less money to keep it um, in native forbs and, and plants that can provide nectar and pollen. Um, so long as we keep the trees out of a lot of that um, borderline land, it can be really excellent forage. And so that's part of part of the emphasis of this magazine. I want it to be a place where we can actually have discourse and discussion, where we don't get into our entrenched camps, but we come at it with an open mind and, and learn to listen to the other side of the of the of the same issue, right? We we all want the best for our bees. Um, we just don't all agree on what those bees tend to be. So <laughs> Well, there's 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 got to be uh, consensus in between. It doesn't have to be polarizing. Um, and it, it really is just, it, it's a matter of, of listening to one another. I mean, beekeepers come in a huge range, right? From treatment-free to treating on a, on a very specific regime. And 
both of those solutions can work extremely well so long as you monitor your varroa population and you stay on top of it. Um, we, we, we all have a wide spectrum of what we personally feel works for us. And it, it's always a question of time management, what you're willing to do, what works for you in your location. And everything is very region specific. Yeah. I'm finding that to be the truth up here in the Pacific Northwest. It's a different world from Ohio. So. Yes, I can imagine. <laughs> Well, the uh, the other part of the other some of the other stories that you've got, you know, Marla's article on propolis. You've talking to Tom Seely, um, and those two people, and that subject right there, propolis, um, kind of getting away from two million blossoms, but not really, is going towards towards uh, the propolis shell that's on the inside of trees Correct. that bees are living in, and uh, Tom's book. We've talked to Tom recently about about the natural habit, the natural nest of a, of a honeybee colony being in a tree lined with propolis, no ventilation at the top, um, a small entrance at the bottom, and, and a limited, limited cavity. Taking that and putting it in the habitat that you're talking about, taking that, 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 that honeybee environment, one colony per square mile, living in trees, is that a workable solution? Is that something that, that probably would work in the native areas that you were mentioning before? That's probably not going to be a comp competition, do you think? No, I think if we have the, the low density of bee colonies where, where you really don't have the disease transmission between colonies, I think that's perfectly acceptable in a native area. Um, I'm not sure how many beekeepers would want to trek all the way into a native area and manage one one colony per square kilometer. Um, there, there's a lot of transportation costs involved in that. Um, I, I, my guess is in those natural areas, feral colonies will become established. I mean, I'm in Arizona where we we have no problem with feral colonies. We we have homeowners who are not so happy when they take <laughs> up residence in their uh, below their mailboxes or in their water meters. Um, so feral honeybees can do very, very well in, in, in habitats, not just Africanized bees, but up in the our North for, no forest, they have recovered to the same numbers that, that Seeley found before Varroa. Um, but I don't, I don't know if those colonies, when they're managed in the Darwinian beekeeping style, if that fits in with the pollination needs that a lot of our agriculture needs, right? So where you need a certain force um, that's that's able to come out even in cool or, or cooler weather conditions, um, and that can be moved into a vast monoculture, right? It becomes very difficult to move a natural tree cavity um, into a giant field of squash that needs pollination. Um, and so there are different solutions for different parts of our agricultural system and our habitat. Um, and we tend to think of beekeeping as just, oh, honeybees are perfect for everything. And, it, and, it, it, and they are in many ways general, generalist pollinators. Um, but in many situations, um, we have to consider what we're, what we're trying to accomplish as well. Well, Carson, I know you didn't just drop out of the sky and start this magazine without a lot of background. Give me, I'm kind of familiar with your background, but, but fill, in some of our, uh, fill in some of what you've been doing before you got here so our listeners have a little bit of a feel for who you are and what you've been doing. Sure. So um, I was an English major, and after I graduated from college, I, decided, I was living on a farm, and I had put in some wildflowers, and I wanted pollinators for that garden. And so I attended a beekeeping short course, um, and I had no intention of becoming a beekeeper, but I ended up winning a hive in, in a raffle. Uh, not the bees, <laughs> just the box. Um, you know, once you, have the bee, once you have the box, you end up stocking it with bees. And as any good beekeeper starting out knows, you, you don't want to start with just one. So I started with three. Um, three turned into about 20 within a very short time period. Um, and then on a whim, I applied for a German Chancellor Fellowship from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation to study the differences between European and American beekeeping. Part of the reason I got that grant was actually I had, I had written an article for Bee Culture, and they ended up publishing the, a beautiful pollen shot I had on the cover. Um, and that fellowship allowed me to be in Europe for 18 months, wow. meeting with beekeepers, bee breeders, bee scientists, and learning very about all the different management techniques that they have in Europe for keeping bees. 
Um, that fascinated me so much that I wanted to keep doing what I had been doing. And so I enrolled in, in a graduate program and earned my PhD in bee biology, um, where I had focused on honeybee pheromones and how brood actually manipulates their caregivers to find the right resources of pollen and nectar. Um, and then after that, I was during that time period, I'd been writing quite a bit for American Bee Journal and uh, Joe Graham was stepping down from American Bee Journal and encouraged me to apply. And so I had edited um, American Bee Journal for a year. And before that, I had also edited uh, the quarterly magazine Bee World from the International Bee Research Association. So I have sort of the career capital and the know-how of how to put a magazine together. Yeah, so Kim, you, you've you influenced, quite, here's yet another person whose bee culture has influenced and, and propelled along their career path. There you go, yeah. So uh, Kirsten, you can blame Kim, or, or thank Kim, <laughs> thank Kim, sorry, thank. Did I say blame? I meant thank. <laughs> she did, she published an article I just wrote for her. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, 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 an interesting, and uh, if I recall you, when you were, uh, in graduate school, you were with Rob Page? Oh, yes, I had done my PhD with Rob Page, um, who's known for his strain of pollen hoarding bees that he had done many generations of selecting on. Well, as a, as another coincidence in our, in our past here, Kirsten, Rob Page was a postdoc at the USDA Bee Lab in Madison when I was there uh, doing, doing uh, pollination research. So uh, Rob and I go back quite a ways, and now it looks like you and I go back quite a ways. So uh, yes. in, interesting, interesting coincidences. There, there are. It's, it, it's in many ways that uh, beekeeping is a very small industry in a very big world. Yes, well, I know you're not only doing a magazine. What else are you involved in at the moment? So I'm actually back working with Rob Page. I'm at Arizona State University at the Global Biosocial Complexity Initiative, which is between Arizona State and the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico. Um, so we're, we're trying to get um, an international collaboration off the ground. So I have a half-time appointment at Arizona State, and next year I will be starting a half-time appointment at the Free University in Berlin, Germany, in a robotics lab, where they have an amazing tracking system of four honeybees on an observation hive. You can track over 4,000 individuals for their entire lifespan. Wow. And with machine learning, it can actually decode some of their behaviors um, when they're doing a waggle dance or when they're engaging in trophallaxis. And then with scanners at the entrance and at a feeding station, you know when they leave the hive, how long they're out, if they make it to the feeder station, and how long it takes for their return journey. So we're trying to disentangle information flows within the colony and how communication ripples throughout all the individuals. Well, that well two would be things. Fun. I got I, I got to say two things. One is I trust that you'll come back and talk to us again and tell us how that's going. Most that sounds definitely. fascinating. And and I'm glad I'm not a bee. There's no privacy and even in a beehive anymore. <laughs> it's worse nope. than worse than Google or Amazon. They know everything you're doing. <laughs> this is this is definitely true. So, and, and and I hope I, I hope you share some of that with the rest of the beekeepers in the world in, in the regular bee, bee journals and, and uh, bee culture and American bee journals so that they can keep they too can keep up with what you're doing. It sounds I, I, fascinating. I most certainly will. Yeah, it's a great lab. It's Tim Landkraft's lab at, in the Free University. He's the one who built the um, Robo Bee. That can, it's a little machine that does a yes. bee, bee waggle dance and yes. will be followed by actual live bees. Um, and he also has a system with a robo fish um, where they look at collective behavior in fish schooling and how uh, you have leader follower behavior and what aspects of that behavior control the response. So it should be a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm looking for it. I've, I've always loved a good challenge, and the bigger the challenge, the the, the more I tighten my seatbelt and get ready for takeoff, I guess. so. <laughs> That's great. And just remember that if, if you don't have time for a full sit-down interview like we're doing now, we, we do do, uh, we do do, we, we have our audio postcards where you can just send us a, a, an audio file from your phone and oh. let our listeners know what you're up to or what, what the latest and greatest events are that you're experiencing, and we will... We'll fit them into I, I a podcast. I will definitely do that. I was actually just at our B lab out at Arizona State because we're trying to bring this tracking system over to the United States and get it set up as well. Um, we're really interested at looking at how bees make foraging decisions and then 
if that forage resource changes, how that extinguishes over time. So they stop going to a resource that is no longer available. Oh, nice. Fascinating. You mentioned earlier that you're on um, uh, fundraising for your magazine. If, if I'm, I'm now that you've piqued my interest in reading more about what you're writing and what you're doing, how do I find out about all of this? The easiest way to get to, to both my Kickstarter campaign or my website is just 2millionblossoms.com, um, to the number two, and then Million Blossoms. As I said, we picked the title because we wanted to emphasize that the more flowers we have, the better all our pollinators do. Um, and from that very front page, you'll see a, a link to our Kickstarter campaign, um, or you can subscribe right from the website. But during the Kickstarter campaign, it really helps us if people go and pledge, even if they just pledge a dollar or they just share it on Facebook or other social media channels. What we're really trying to achieve through that campaign is just greater awareness, not just with beekeepers, but with gardeners, master gardeners, um, pollinator-friendly individuals who want to learn more about monarchs who might have a monarch way station. Um, anybody interested in, in turning even just a small patch of their yard into something that attracts the insects that help feed us. We'll have that link on in the show notes. So oh, any perfect. listeners who want to uh, uh, click on that and make it easy, you can go out to your Kickstarter and or subscribe to the magazine. I'm, I'm also doing a great thing at the moment. If you're interested, if you're part of a bee club and you're willing to um, drive traffic to get let people know about the magazine and hand out some postcards, all you have to do is contact me. I will send you a stack of postcards. And they're, um, for, I will also donate a subscription to the club for their club library or they can raffle it off. And I saw those postcards. They're really attractive. Nice job. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So yes, we've actually had, um, we've worked with some artists to get a lot of custom graphics made. As I said, I really want this to be a nice visual so that when people put it out on a coffee table and a neighbor or friend is visiting, they can pick it up and just browse and, and curiosity will take over just because of the beautiful images. Um, one of the articles that was contributed was by Rachel uh, Bonin, who's at Tufts University. And she comes from Honeybee Research, but is currently working at a prairie on, on butterflies. And um, whenever she was tracking these butterflies in the prairie, she was always distracted by bees. She's an excellent photographer. And so she has submitted a photo essay and we're really proud to print it. Well, I'm looking forward to the, the publication and looking forward to January now. Looking forward to 2020. When does the first issue come out? It'll be January 2020. We're hoping that it gets into people's mailboxes right around January 7th to 10th. Well, I'll look for my copy. I, I can't wait. <laughs> Well, uh, Kirsten, thank you very much. I'm I'm looking for I'm looking forward to your magazine. I'm looking forward to your audio postcards and and what you can contribute to uh, the rest of the journals in the world and and keeping us up to speed on what's going on with what you're doing. Thank you for being here today. Anything you want to add? Um, I'm open to submissions from anybody, and I, I really encourage people who haven't written for a general audience to. Go ahead and submit if you have a story idea or something that's fascinating. I've worked with a lot of writers who've never written before. And just by going back and forth, we can usually craft it into a story that, that is people will love to read. Well, there you are, Jeff. You're looking for something to do, right? In all my spare time, you bet. I, <laughs> I'm really not doing much between midnight and 4 a.m. And I think I would like to fill it with something then worthwhile. And this would be well, fantastic, there you go. fantastic project. Kirsten, it's been wonderful meeting you uh, actually in, in person. And, and uh, look forward to hearing from you. And as Kim said, uh, receiving my audio postcards from you and, and the success of the quarterly. Best Thank of luck so to much. you. Thank you for joining us on Beekeeping Today podcast. Thanks, Kirsten. Pleasure. Kirsten, it was good chatting. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me on the show. You bet. Bye-bye. Bye. I enjoyed that conversation with Kirsten. She's, uh, she's really energetic, and she's got a great project underway. I look forward to receiving that first quarterly. I, uh, I, I, I am too, Jeff. I got to tell you, I'm... Uh, when I'm, she first announced this and, and said she was looking for authors, I tossed something her way and she actually accepted it. And now I sit back and I look at the other people that she's got writing for her and I'm sort of in awe of, of the company that I'm in. But that's the kind of thing that we don't have in this industry at the moment. We, mm -hmm. We've got two really good publications that are 
much more practical than than not. And Kirsten is looking at going just a somewhat different, filling a different niche. And yeah. I'm looking forward to what she's doing and, and more down the road. Yeah, I like the idea that she's encompassing all of the pollinators and, and not only honeybees, but all the pollinators and with a focus, of course, on honeybees. But I, I think... You know, a rising tide floats all ships, and and the more we can get exposure and a need for uh, pollinators, all pollinators, the better it'll be for honeybees as well. You know, about a year ago or a while ago, I was in New Zealand, and and the folks in New Zealand are were going through, or still are going through, issues with manuka honey. And the problems of people crowding in on your bee yards and stealing hives and all of the things that were going on because of the gold rush with that honey. And they invited me down there to talk about the ethics of beekeeping and looking at that situation. So I'll be interested to see what the ethics are in this journal, who the, the, what the author considers um, maybe even unethical behavior, but certainly the ethics that we need to attend, attend to to keep things moving in the right direction. Uh, something that has not been addressed much in this industry. Well, that about wraps it up for this podcast. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. We want to thank this week's sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. And while you're there, give them a shout out for sponsoring this podcast. And of course, we want to thank Bee Culture for their continued support of this podcast. And finally, and most importantly, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments at questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else? And you we want don't. To and we. I'm going to interrupt you here, Jess. Yeah. We don't hear much. I think. I think. Um, I think. I think we should stress that more, because uh, I'm sure that there's the thousands of people that are out there. They got to have something that we didn't answer, or they want to know more about. So I too encourage you to contact us. Excellent. I think that wraps it up, Jeff. It was a good a good show today. Kirsten, thank you, and listeners, thank you. And we've just passed Thanksgiving, so we're heading for Christmas. There you go, on the home stretch. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye-bye.